Welcome to the Healing Center Conversations podcast, where we create space for conversations that heal. I'm your host, Dr. Byron McClure, a nationally certified school psychologist. I, along with our special guests, will give you insight to promote collective healing by putting people first. Through weekly conversations with educators, psychologists, and healers, we'll discuss ways to heal, thrive, and live your best life. This is the Healing Center Conversations Podcast. Welcome to the Healing Center Conversations Podcast, where we create space for conversations that heal. I'm your host, Dr. Byron McClure, and we have a very special guest with us today, none other than Dr. Linda McGee. Dr. Linda Fleming McGee is a practicing clinical psychologist who speaks and writes nationally on mental health and education. Dr. McGee, welcome to the Healing Center Conversations podcast. I could not be happier to be here, and thank you so much for giving those Flemings, my family of origin, some credit. <laughs> Today, not, no disrespect to the uh, McGee's, my husband's wonderful family. <laughs> yes, yes, always, absolutely. So who is Dr. Linda McGee? Well, I'm a Indiana native, one of 12 kids, grew up and uh, was the first one to graduate. And from college in my family, and I moved out to the west, uh, the, to the east coast, to go to a uh, law school, where I spent about 15 years being a lawyer, and kept being pulled toward the volunteer space, the human services space. But I had gotten to this level in banking law where you know few people see, and it was hard for me. And but I just kept getting pulled to my volunteer work. And then one day I decided to start thinking about switching. And fortunately for me, I have an extremely supportive, loving spouse who supported that along with, you know, a boatload of pay cut. <laughs> and I went back to school to GW and I started seeing kids and I started to teach and I opened a practice and I worked in schools. And so that's, I came through your yard. I came through the learning disorder schools. So, and then I went over to private schools that weren't learning disorder, but I, you know, interned in charter school. And so I, I've been in those rough towns. And now what I want to do for the rest of my career are a couple of things. One is to help train the next generation of awesome black psychologists and to try to make this field better for them and for African-Americans generally. And I love that. And that's so necessary. And we're going to talk a lot about that. Before we can get into that, though, I want to dive a little bit deeper into that pivot, right? Because you just made that seem just so, oh, yeah, I was a lawyer. I was practicing. <laughs> and then I became a psychologist. <laughs> no, that's hard. Yes. Right? Like very. How, how many people can never even pass the bar, right. right? But you did that. You became a practicing lawyer. Then you were like, you know what? I'm bored with this. I'm just going to become a psychologist. Like, what was the process for switching and the, the true motivation for moving into psychology? I think that this is not the sexiest answer, but I think that I kind of got in touch with who I am. And, you know, that at heart, I'm a lover, not a fighter. And I'm a healer and not a divider. And once I accepted that part as a good part, as a strong part and not a weak part, because, you know, toughness is value in this society. And, and I am every bit of that, obviously. But to accept that there was a part of me that I was tamping down, which was that vulnerable part that wanted to be a healer. And that I think that's what, in essence, was drawing me. Like, I was volunteering with these kids' groups with AIDS. And I was volunteering with unwed mothers' groups and serving on boards. And I would come home feeling like, that was great, you know? <laughs> and then I would leave, go to my day job where I was getting more and more promotions and more and more money and not having that same feeling. And then I just remembered an administration came in that I ended up helping that was from the opposite party of what I was 
in, but I ended up helping them do some transition work in banking. And they asked me, did I want anything? Right. And I was like, no. And that's when I knew that it was time for me to go. And I just started to hunt around. Like, I'm not going to go back to school for a long time. I'm just going to go get a counseling degree. And then I was like, well, that's two years, but I may not be able to practice. So then that morphed into an MSW. And then I was like, well, if I'm going to do two years in an internship year, I might as well look at the doctor. <laughs> programs and so that morphed into me looking at PhDs and CITES and, and I'm in DMV just in Maryland and Virginia for the people that don't know what that means I'm in the DMV and there are like plenty of options and so what I ended up doing was I chose George Washington because they had a CID program that went year round and I had a little two-year-old Dr. Byron <laughs> And now he's, you know, six foot five inch, you know, <laughs> adult, but I had a little guy. And so I was like, my bet to myself is I would be out of school by the time he was in kindergarten. So I, I was like, well, then GW it is because it was three years in an internship year. And some of the other programs was four, five and six years. So, you know, five, six and seven years. And so that's how I ended up at GW. And I had already gone to the law school there. Right. So I, you know, so I had experience with that school and I knew that it was a solid school. So yeah, it was seriously hard. It's seriously, I'm not going to undersell it for anybody with a two-year-old that's going back to school. <laughs> and then I had to give up a salary to do it. Right. And, you know, I was in a banking agency, which you probably don't know this, but they don't have a government scale <laughs> for salaries. They can make more than what the typical government worker makes. And so, you're, you know, my salary was limited by the president's salary. You know, so I had to give up that. And so not everybody has those circumstances. And so I realized that I landed in psychology in a privileged position. I landed on second because I had been successful in another career. And so I had the confidence to come into to this second career with my head up, right? And that's a big bonus because I see some of the younger kids that are coming from HBCUs and they're coming into like schools like George Washington and it's a really rough transition. So I had already gone through systems where I had gone to University of Michigan, I had gone to GW, all those things helped me to land in this field a little bit easier. It wasn't easy, but it's a little bit easier than some of our, you know, younger colleagues coming into these doctorate programs. Yeah. And so you earned your degree. It was in clinical psychology, correct? Yes. Uh-huh. And so you go on to practice or you went into schools after that? I went into both. So I worked for learning disorder schools and I was an assessment person, which is why you see these talks that I give on assessment. Because at heart, when I went into the GW program, assessment made more sense to me like banking. It was like I could connect dots, right? It was like, you know, it was more on the ground to me than therapy. And I went to a psychodynamic program and it just seemed like a lot of it seemed like real woo-woo. But assessment was like, I can figure this kid out. You know, it was more like what I was used to. So I was working in schools that for learning disorders where kids in the district were being sent because the parents were suing because the district wasn't serving them. So they were private schools, but they were being funded by lawsuit where the district was funding the kids to go there. And I also always worked in private practice. And I had, again, African-American pediatricians supporting me my own child's pediatrician was like if you do this i'ma back you and so like i practiced out of her office on saturdays when she wasn't there and i saw her patients and that helped me to be known by people so she followed through on her word dr cheryl edmonds i'm just gonna name check her now who's my son's pediatrician who helped me and then i worked in practices and then i eventually established my own practice and that takes a long time right especially if you're in a field like assessment that costs a lot of money for people to get their child assessed um and now you know i do i have my own practice and as you will know i do a whole bunch of other stuff and including like i said trying to like open up circles for the next people to come in yeah and thinking about that next circle that the next batch of upcoming psychologists. One of the things that I'm hearing you say is that assessment matters to you. And I would imagine that teaching this upcoming field about assessment practices matters. So what are some of the things that you found 
as a clinician in private practice, working in some of those schools, especially around multicultural assessments and evaluations, really for people who look like us. I want to first start off with what we're using as terms. Like when I say assessments, I don't just mean like the long testing that you get for learning disorders and executive function, even though obviously I'm a specialist in those things, as well as, uh, you know, uh, other areas of assessment. But I'm talking about how our children are assessed generally when they come into the classroom right? How are they being judged? How are they being looked at clinically? So I'm talking about the whole process because teachers, counselors, all these people are making judgments and and even diagnoses about what they see based on behaviors. So I'm not just talking about the formal testing where I sit down with an intelligence test or personality test. I'm talking about how they're assessing our children. We can talk more about that in a minute. But one of the things that I've done is I taught assessment for a few years at the school that I went to, George Washington. But I've also done a couple of other things. One, I just established in the last two years a multicultural assessment community on Facebook. And people can join that. It's multicultural assessment community. And what we did with Dr. Tanisha Drummond and Dr. Shalina Hurd two awesome young psychologists is that we started this community and we had our first conference this past October, highly successful, uh, sponsored by some of the testing companies and some uh, telehealth companies to start to look at how do we assess uh, boys. We looked at LGBTQ because a lot of people in the African-American community have intersectionality right? They intersect with those communities. We looked at assessing capital cases, right? We look, you know, so we had our first conference. It was successful. We have decided to do it every year and to make sure, you know, open it more and more up to school. We had a lot of school people come in this year, but we're going to make a big concerted effort to get a lot more school psychologists in where we are trying to be a part of that solution. Where you're talking about that healing conversation, that's a healing conversation to say, you know, that, you know, one of the big premises in my talks is that we're not looking at the child underneath. We're looking at the surface child. We're looking at their behaviors, but we're missing the thing that's under the surface, which is the trauma, right? We're missing the trauma. So we're saying that he won't sit still in class and then I literally would get the kid and I'll find out his mom has stage four breast cancer. Well, yes, he is acting out in class because his mother's dying. Okay. So I established that community along with my colleagues. I'm out there giving talks about ethically competent assessment in schools, ethically competent assessments generally for the variety of multicultural communities. I've been on podcasts that are devoted to that and that are being played in classes uh, across the country. There's a gentleman that's called the testing psychologist, and he's been one of my supporters. So I've got done unconscious bias training with podcasts with him that are being played in classrooms. So there is a hunger and a need for this. And so what I'm trying to do is to help our colleagues do better, right? While at the same time, opening up this field of assessment to others, because just when we were talking earlier about the percentages of black psychologists in the country is like about 4%. That's the ones that do therapy, right? So when you think about assessment, that's just a small percentage of that, right? But the schools are the ones where that are doing a lot of assessments daily because of the special ed laws. And so to have this message go out that you're kindly allowing me to bring, that this is one of the communities that are assessing kids at every level every day by law. And so this is one of the communities that we really want to sort of tap into, see if we can be a part of solving some of the disconnects that I see. Yeah. And I think there's so much value in everything that you just mentioned. I want to hear you talk a little bit about if we had a magic wand and we do all of these things, what are some of the benefits? What are some of the outcomes that we could expect to see? You'd have better results. Right. I mean, you have a kid that comes into your school system, right? He might be on the autism spectrum, right? We still have black kids diagnosed three years later (laughs) than white children. 
right? Getting certain less, less services. Just think about what that three years could mean in the life, in the confidence, and the trajectory of a child. Think about what would happen if we had a child that came into the classroom whose mother had cancer, and instead of sending him out and suspending him but based on his behavior, we had him in groups, support groups, where other mothers were ill or kids who, you know, losing their mothers. And we matched him up against some with someone like you, where he may be after school, he could be in a club and there, where there was support that was working with families, with the understanding that black families come into this system differently. So, you know, they have to be worked with, with the eye toward understanding that when they come into the system, there is a understandable level of distrust, right? So the ability to sort of cross those boundaries and get on the same side to partner with families. But the bottom line is, if we were actually treating what was wrong, right? When you say somebody has ADHD and they're in fact anxious, then and then you're disappointed with the results, right? There's not, he's not getting better, right? And I think there will be less burnout with the people, your colleagues that are actually in schools and are in these settings that are frustrated themselves because their resources are being, their time and energy and passions are being directed down hallways that don't necessarily lead to the doorway, right? So I think that our results will be better, our children will be better, and I do think that sort of would benefit all of us. And that is that kind of collectivity that people are losing a bit in this society. This is on us. If our kids are coming out of school with more mental illness, with more anxiety, with more depression, it's on all of us. We don't want to be bringing in a third of the adults that have already suffered from major bouts of anxiety, major bouts of depression, suicide rate up, everything. And this was all before COVID, right? (laughs) Which didn't help anything, right? So, I mean, I just, going back to the answer is I just think that we we as a society would be better and our children would be better. And I totally agree with you. And why I am happy to be able to have this conversation with someone else who is equally passionate and doing the work to increase recruitment, to increase retention. Retention is important as well, right? How are we getting people into the field, but then how are we keeping them in the field so that they're not leaving so that we can improve the results. So I, I want to shift a little bit. You recently did a documentary. I did. Right? I'm did. good, bro. What was the documentary about and what was your role in it? Okay, so I'm going to try to make this short because we can't, everything can't be a long story. But, you know, you can hear in my voice that I'm passionate about Black people getting mental health support when they need it. To that end, I was trying to figure out how to make my voice wider than the treatment room, right? And so one of the things that I did a few years ago was that when I I have this radio show that's called Good Mental Health, and I promote supporting African-American mental health, it's on Radio One. And so I had been just searching the internet about people that were making that point. And I came across these young filmmakers and they had said, oh, we just dropped a trailer for I'm Good Bro, Unmasking Black Male Depression, right? So I was like, Oh my goodness, when you guys finish the film, call me back and I'll do, I'll have you on the show. So I had them on the show. Then I was like, what more can I do for them? Right. So I just supported them coming to the DMV three times, you know, but bigger audiences. And what we found, oh, Dr. Byron, it was something. You know, because we we were going to audiences in Southeast D.C. where there's just, you know, black male audiences. And the things that we heard black men get up and say, they just sent shivers down our spine. Like, you know, for example, sexual abuse, you know, people undergoing sexual abuse that, that, you know, for me, it's a sad day, but it's also a wonderful day to get men getting up there talking about their pain. So when they made a sequel about 2020 i'm good bro the year 2020 they asked me charles crouch the filmmakers to be in the sequel because of what happened with kobe bryant and john lewis and just this whole COVID thing you know like what the profound effect 
of 2020 on Black America that wasn't really being reported. And so they made this short documentary called I'm Good, Bro, the year 2020, where it started, and, you know, and as the death of like Kobe Bryant impacted lots of African-American males in particular, we started to chronicle like what that year was like. And so I was in that document. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but if for those of you out there, it's on YouTube, please check it out. Both films are wonderful. Yeah, and we're going to include that in the show notes so all of our listeners will be able to, to get access to that. And it sounds powerful. I'm not sure if you know or not, but I actually worked in uh, Southeast D.C. at Anacostia High School. I did not know that. I did not know that. All righty now. So you've been there, right? Yes, yes. Uh So that's, as you mentioned that, it automatically clicked for what the filmmakers, what you all were going for, because those conversations need to happen more. And we also need to get the message out of what's happening in these communities, right? And creating awareness around mental illness and creating awareness around mental wellness and how it's impacting all the different aspects and dynamics within that community. But that's exciting because the message is getting through. It's slow. The stigmas and the, the you know, the ideas of masculinity and getting help, they're, they're entrenched. But the message is starting to get through. And I look at my young son and I look at him talking to his friends and, you know, the, the idea of getting a therapist is not like, as, as uh, Jay-Z said, that, that we're more scared of the therapist than we are the police, you know? <laughs> but the word is getting out there. And so things are changing. And it's exciting to work with people like you to be out there on the forefront of that. Yeah, and it's, it's definitely shifting and changing, which is powerful. And I think people like you, who also is a host of a radio show, it's it's getting the word out there. So talk a little bit about uh, the radio show that you have, Good Mental Health. I am excited about it. And I, I want to just give a little preview that I'm, I'm in the midst of exciting rebranding of that. And I have been thinking about like this radio show, which I have been doing for a couple of years now. And I do it on segments mostly pertaining to African-American mental health. This is on Radio 1, which is an African-American owned company. But I do it on all kinds of topics, educational topics, organizing organization like or executive function is a huge issue i do it on black male depression i do it i just did a show on the real self-care right not just a massage right start doing some of that real inner work and so what i'm going to do in the next year i'm really excited to is i'm going to podcast it but i'm also going to use it as a platform for all things black mental health because really what my focus is is supporting african-american health in terms of mental health Right. And so I am in the process of rebranding it. So look out for that in January, where it's not just a radio show, but it will be a platform for all things at a website, social media on all things that have to do with black mental health, including a speaker's bureau, where I want to organize people that have similar backgrounds to go through my site and to list their services so that when people are looking for experts, there will be a forum, a place that they can find it in one location. We're also going to be obviously publishing lots of resources and studies and everything we can get our hand on. I am loving what I'm hearing from you so far. One of the things that you do, you give signature talks. And in one of your signature talks, you talk about the audacity of self-care. Break that down for us. Well, I mean, you think about the minority and people of color community, right? They are in a one-down position in this country. And when I talk about audacity, I mean, it's an act of self-love to say, I am going to put my needs first. You know, the expectations we put on black men, the expectations we put on black women, it is audacious and revolutionary to say for 12 minutes today, I am tuning y'all out and doing meditation. I'm tuning you out to do prayer. I am going to take some time to build up what is being you know torn apart (laughs) little by little by this society i'm gonna take the time to take care of myself i'm gonna take the time to cook a pot of greens right as opposed to just eat what i you know carry out like for me now i'll do soup 
like a couple of times a month, I'll just make a big pot of soup. And it's like a wonderful thing, but I have to take that time away from someone else or something else without guilty. So when I say it's audacious and it's revolutionary, it is, it is, it's not just those words, but it's crucial, right? I mean, we have to build up ourselves on a day-to-day basis in order to be healthy, resilient people that we are right? But it requires us to take care of ourselves and not let the world continue to take and take and take without us understanding the cost of that, right? And that we have to take care of ourselves. We have to get to the gym. That's why I have my fan on this morning when you were asking about the fan. It's because I just came from a workout. So I was trying to cool down quickly, you know, but that was the first priority before even you, Dr. Byron, today. But that's what I mean. It's it's audacious to say I'm going to take. I think enough of myself and my family to put them first. I love that. And it's an absolute must. Even before this very podcast, you are practicing uh, this audacious form of self-care. Can you talk a little bit about the Steve Fund? Mm Mm-hmm. The Steve Fund is an organization that supports mental health for college students of color all over the country. And it is a huge endeavor that one woman undertook after the tragic death of her son. And so she started Steve Fund because Steve was her son and he uh, died by suicide. And she took that awful event and she turned it into a positive thing and started this foundation. And so I am proud to be a mental health expert for them. I go around, I've gone to colleges, I do panels regularly. I moderate, which I love uh, learning from other people. This is my way, my own little continuing education. But they're out there as resources. You can look up the Steve Fund on, you know, to get, for those of you out there who are budding speakers, they have resources online, they have programs at colleges they're even now working in corporate america because you know the kid graduates from college and they go into the same kind of environment they help the kid understand race in the context of being in college and what's happening to them why they feel like they don't want to go to their professors when they have you know problems and you know because you know stereotype threats and imposter syndrome all of these things that happen in the in the life of a young black adult, a young person of color as an adult, they help them to sort of integrate that and to start thinking about self-care in terms of what being black moving through those circles means, right? And helps you to take care of yourself and to fortify yourself and to understand that what you're doing is a normal part of the process. But in order to be successful in these environments, sometimes we have to step out of what's safe and reach out and get help, right? Instead of isolating because we don't want the professor to know, we don't want him to think that we're having problems, right? So this organization helps to support students of color in terms of their mental health. And it's a wonderful group. Yeah, it really sounds like a a wonderful group. And of course, it has to be wonderful if you're affiliated with it. But you're Thank also, you. yeah, of course. And you're also contributing to another project, the Sunrise Project. Share a little bit about that project. Yeah, I've been really fortunate in the last couple of years that a lot has happened positively. So the things that I put out there, so that's just a sort of a, a shout out to the people that are younger than me, that are out there striving like yourself, they are out there trying to put the word out. It's just keep putting the word out, okay, because it'll come back to you. And so now of, of all these years of giving, you know, speeches for free and uh, in churches and sorority groups and, you know, it's starting to pay off. But the Sunrise Project is a very special thing in my life because it grew out of a friend of mine's struggle with her child. And one of the things that I have been saying is that where do parents go for support? How do I help parents process what it's like to have a child? No matter what class you're in, to have a child that's not doing well or that may be suffering from mental illness or might have dropped out of college. And then, you know, how do you deal with it? So it started off just to call on Sundays at sun at sunrise. That's how we, we started calling it. That my friend had a son. We, so we called a sunrise S-O-N at first, right? And we did the calls at like seven something in the morning. So then we, we got off of that because that was too early. And we do them now at 9 a.m. And what is exciting about it is it just has grown. Parents from all over the country call in. We have topics. 
And the exciting thing is, is that the Oprah Winfrey Network has made us a part of their podcast network. And so that is the most uh, exciting and rewarding thing that someone like Oprah sees the value of supporting parents of color who there, where there is not a lot of support for when you're a child and our children don't get as many shots, uh, uh, you know, of making it right. They pay heavily for their mistakes, right? The mistakes that are a normal part of youth. And I see in my practice or that other kids can recover from easier. We do. So the pressure on parents is enormous. And so for someone like Oprah Winfrey to see the value in that is a real rewarding thing. And so now we're a part of their podcast network and it's, it's just exciting. Very cool. So you can say that you are part of own the yes, own network was, yes uh-huh i was featured on the first sunrise project call talking about uh what do you do about depression and you know a teenage depression when you see it in your kids and uh it is one of my proudest i'm still it still kind of hit me if you really want me to be honest with you it still hasn't really struck but every every now and again somebody like you will bring it up and i'm like yeah <laughs> it's a wonderful thing very cool very cool so just listening to you speak, you have done so many wonderful things. The work that you're doing has the potential to continue the the impact that just can move mountains for, for our children, for their families. So I'm interested to hear in your perspective, what does being healing-centered mean to you? Being healing-centered means to me that I can spend all this time, we can spend all this time talking about problem, but to me, he being healing center is the recognition that how many things we have going for us and how do we build resiliency within this structure. And I got into this field because I believe that people can do better and be better. You have to be an optimist to be in mental health care at heart, right? Because otherwise, why would you be in it, right? I mean, I guess there's some reasons, but (laughs) I think I'm a, a healer at heart, like I started off talking about. And I definitely feel like that there is an opportunity to go out there and talk about how we can build on the healing within our community, how we can help other people that are not in our community recognize how they can be better healers. And that's what I'm about now is that I'm shifting my mindset from me personally being the healer to bringing up hopefully, you know, if I could say it in my humblest voice to help grow some healers and to help within our community, but to help healers across all professions and across all races, because the chances are with the numbers, the way they are is our children are going to be seeing somebody that's not of their race. Right. And so, you know, I can't ignore that. So I'm trying to take the word out there in a way that can be heard, metabolized and taken in, right? Because if you're not heard and metabolized and taken in, if you're dismissed, we're not going to get anywhere. But to tell the truth, but to do it in a way where I'm offering solution. So, so to me, healing center means to build resilience and to bring solutions and to just sort of undergird that, you know, there's a lot of healing to be done, not just within our own community, but within the larger cultures. I absolutely love that because there's so much healing that can be done. It's going to take those who are further along in their healing journey to then help and support others in their healing journey. So I love that. And, and to say that we're all on a journey and there's no, I tell people all the time, there is no finish line. Okay. Okay. I'm learning each and every day about various cultures and things that I've never learned. And I sit in on, I sit in on webinars myself to learn about, you know, gender pronouns and, you know, how to address the desire for people in the LGBTQ community, how to listen to the concerns of very little herd of communities like the Muslim communities, right, where that are really suffering from, you know, the slings of discrimination and oppression in this country. So there's no finish line. We are all people, humans in development. Right. And that's the key. It's like, I'm not going to judge you for where you are, but if you want to get on this spectrum of moving toward being a healer of all, then if I can impact that in 
any tiny way and I have no illusions that you know of, of a huge impact but if one person in a 200 person talk goes back and calls that mother instead of working at odds with the mother then I feel like I will have done my job and you are doing an exceptional job Dr. Linda McGee as we come to a close any closing thoughts for our listeners I want to throw it back on you guys and, and just say how proud I am of some of the work that you you and other young people are doing because you've learned how to harness, you speak up earlier, you're using social networks for good, and you're trying to be a part of the solution. And I want to applaud you and encourage you and you know one of the reasons why i wanted to be here today is to say that is that you guys are taking a ball and you're running with it and i couldn't be prouder of you that means a lot and i'm sure i'm speaking for all of our listeners where we stand on the shoulder of giants and those who have come before us so you have laid a foundation those who came before you laid the foundation and it's up to us to continue that right and i'm i know i'm going to do everything i can to be relentless in that pursuit. So it's, it's been a pleasure having you. How can people find you and get in touch with you? You can find me on all the social media, Facebook, Linda McGee, LinkedIn, Linda McGee. It's under my name, Dr. Linda underscore McGee one on Instagram, Twitter at Dr. Linda McGee. So you can find me at my email is Dr. Linda at Dr. L McGee.com. So there are all kinds of ways that you can find me. I have a speaker website, Linda McGee.com that you can feel free to go on to find me and to book me. And so you can find me all over the place basically right now and look forward to some of the things that I'm going to be doing in the future. I have some, I have some plans. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. But, mm -hmm. Stay tuned, right? Yes, right? Watch this space. <laughs> Let's watch it. Dr. McGee, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for this Healing Center conversation. To our listeners, thanks for listening. Make sure that you follow us across all social media platforms at Healing Convo Pod. Be sure to tell a friend to tell a friend to listen to the Healing Center Conversations podcast. Until next time.